Hi, this is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute presenting how to treat distal coronary perforations. Coronary perforation is a complication that is particularly relevant for chronic total occlusion interventions but also applies to any PCI. In a recent survey of more than a thousand cardiologists, the number one feared complication for CTOPCI was perforation and tamponade highlighting the importance of knowing how to prevent it and how to treat it. There are three major kinds of perforation. The first one is the main vessel perforation, where there is rupture within the main vessel architecture. And we already have a webcast describing how to treat this that focuses mainly on delivering covered stents. Distal wire perforation is the second major category, and there is also a special group called the collateral vessel perforation that applies to retrograde CTO intervention. However, many of those can be treated with techniques discussed on how to treat distal wire perforation. This is the first case. This is a patient who had a significant diagonal lesion. Stand delivered to the lesion was challenging and involved a severe guide and guide wire movement. The wire used was an extra support whisper wire. It is important to look at the wire movement. It is further down the vessel and with every beat seems to be coiling. The stand was placed and then after we put a stand, there are five things that we should always check for, both at the site of the stand as well as distally. At the site of the stand, we make sure there is no perforation, which is not. Make sure there is no dissection in the proximal or distal edge and make sure the side branches are all there. But we also want to look distally on whether there's a perforation or distal embolization. So looking more carefully distally, there is no embolization, but there's some staining. And that staining is highly suggestive of a distal coronary perforation. So the first lesson here is that one needs to watch the wire. And also, after using a polymer wire to cross, it is best to actually replace that wire for a workhorse guide wire, which may have less chance to exit through the small distal branches and cause a perforation. This is transthoracic echo done after this was seen, and there is no pericardial effusion. And the question became what to do next? Should we do something or just observe this, given that there didn't seem to be a lot of ongoing extravasation? And that brings us to the algorithm for managing perforations, which we like to divide into two major categories. The first part is the so-called universal algorithm that describes four steps that apply to any kind of perforation at any time, any, any circumstance. And the very first step is to actually stop the bleeding into the pericardium. So the first, first step is to inflate a balloon to occlude the vessel and prevent further extravasation of blood. The second one is to give fluids and potentially pressures if the pressure goes down, but if the pressure goes down due to tamponade, then pericardiocentesis may be needed. If there's a large amount of blood coming out, then taking the blood and giving it back to the patient through a vein is another option, autotransfusion. And fourth, one can notify the surgeons, although in the vast majority of cases, surgery is not going to be needed, it may be good to have them on board just in case. Following that, just inflating the balloon can sometimes result in cessation of extravasation, but if further treatment is needed, then the cause should be treated. If it's a large vessel perforation, cover stand is the answer. If it's a distal vessel perforation, then it's either with embolization, with fat or coil, or putting a cover stand over the perforated branch origin. We don't want to reverse in the coagulation until after all equipment is removed, otherwise thrombus can form inside the coronary artery. So in this particular case, a decision was made to observe the patient. The IVC is collapsing, there is no effusion, uh, the heparin was not reversed. However, one hour later, the patient developed hypotension. And this is one of the concerns of distal vessel perforation. Unlike the large vessel perforation in which it's very immediately apparent that there is a big problem, in distal vessel perforation, the rate of bleeding is very low and it may take several hours before tamponade happens. And that is why it is important to treat it even if the patient remains asymptomatic. 
So an hour later, now we have a pericardial effusion. There's some right ventricular collapse, just a conferential effusion. Now the IVC collapses a little less than it did before. And we have a classic pulsus paradoxus on the arterial waveform. So clearly the patient is starting to develop tamponade and an intervention is now needed. So the message is, don't ignore a distal vessel perforation, but treat it early as this is likely to prevent trouble down the line. And this can be particularly a problem if this happens in the middle of the night when there is limited stuff around to take the patient back to the cath lab and fix the problem. In this particular case, pericardiocentesis was performed. One aspect of pericardiocentesis in case of perforation is that X-ray can actually provide guidance. We can see here there's a double shadow. There's contrast in the pericardial effusion and the cavity is um, less opaque. So one can actually have a target about where to do the pericardiocentesis. So there is a wire inserted into the pericardium. We don't want to X-ray our hands to minimize radiation injury. And then after draining the effusion, the, the patient's pulsus paradoxus resolved and the blood pressure now looks great. What is the next step here? How can we treat this ongoing extravasation? And again, going through the algorithm, the first step is to put a balloon. Although in this particular case, it was less of an issue because the rate of bleeding was very low. And then the most common way for sealing and distal perforation is by either fat embolization or coil embolization. There are other potential treatments, for example, aspirate through a microcatheter that may create suction and actually help to seal the distal perforation. Create a thrombus on the table and then inject the thrombus. Create microparticles or give thrombin locally. Of course, that carries the risk of vessel thrombosis if the thrombin leaks more proximally. And there are other ways uh, ongoing, like putting pieces of gel foam, or in some cases, people put uh, pieces of a guide wire in, through the microcatheter. But the fast, by far, the most common ways of embolize is with fat or coil. And there are pluses and minuses for both options. One of them is that fat is not visible, whereas the coils are very well visible. One potential way around this is to dip the fat into contrast that makes it visible and then can be seen under X-ray. The other is about control delivery. The fat is injected, whereas the coil, at least the ones that are detachable, can be delivered and then their optimal position confirmed before releasing. The microcatheter for delivery can be any microcatheter for fat. And if it's a 0.018 coil, a larger microcatheter may be needed, not the standard um, Corsair or Turnpike or Fine Cross, but something large like a prograde. However, if the cath lab has 0.014 coils, for example, the axiom coils, then this can be delivered through a standard microcatheter. Fat is available everywhere, whereas coils sometimes are not available in all the labs. And in terms of cost, the fat has no cost, but coils can be expensive. How is uh, embolization done? The first step is to deliver a microcatheter as close as possible to the site of the perforation. And then the microcatheter is used to deliver, again, usually a fat or a coil. This is how the fat looks like. The fat can be harvested through the arterial access site if femoral access is used. Alternatively, one can make a very small incision in the groin area and then harvest a little piece of fat using the hemostat. These are the little fat globules. And then it can be sometimes challenging to load the fat into a microcatheter because the fat tends to float. So one way to do this is to have it turning upside down and then the fat will go up and then with the aid of an introducer or a needle, the fat can be advanced all the way to the proximal hub and then injecting injected using a small syringe. This is exactly what was done in this case. This is a fine cross delivered into the perforated vessel. The first piece of fat was delivered, but there is, however, continued extravasation. Second piece of fat is delivered again. There is still some extravasation, but eventually the bleeding stopped.
how can we be 100% sure since there's still some staining here probably from the previously injected contrast and one way to do this is um, by giving echo contrast this is uh, a study that was published from uh, Stefan Riffre showing that if one gives echo contrast and there is still continued extravasation some of the echo contrast bubbles are going to go into the pericardium and then we know that we have not sealed the perforation but and we need to do something more in this particular case we gave the contrast into the um, cavity and there is actually no extravasation there are no bubbles going into the pericardium and this is um, uh, a reference for using uh, fat particles recently published in CCI describing the technique uh, we just uh, discussed moving on to the second case which is a case from the manual of CTO interventions a case treated with coil embolization this was a patient who had a right coronary artery CTO small distal vessel clear proximal cap a little more than 40 millimeters we tried undergrade wiring there were no very good retrograde options and we were unable to cross retrograde and eventually using a knuckled guide wire we were able to cross further to the distal vessel try to re-enter with a stingray wire but this did not work and after a lot of effort we finally decided to do an investment procedure and perform STAR all the way to the distal RCA however after ballooning that there was now an area of bleeding and initially we had the question whether this was actually bleeding into a cavity versus the pericardium however when a different view was taken that looks a little more worrisome now and that brings the message that it's always good to assume the worst possible scenario don't get um, satisfied that this might not be a very significant complication this was a large distal vessel perforation that required immediate treatment going again down the universal algorithm the first step is to inflate a balloon to occlude the vessel and then in this particular case we use the coil there are the standard coils which require a bigger microcatheter like the azure coils from terumo and the interlocks from boston scientific but the ones who are preferred because they can be delivered through the standard microcatheter are 0.014 coils like the axiom coil from metronic that can be delivered through a standard microcatheter this is uh, how the box of the prograde microcatheter is this is a larger one these are some other coils um, figure a from boston scientific and uh, this is how an axiom coil is um, deployed the coils essentially is a long wire with a coil attached to the tip and this applies for the detachable coils that uh, one can uh, control the release versus the pushable coils that are just injected and there is no control about where they go the detachable coils like the axiom in this particular case are preferred that's how it comes out of the box and the first step is to load the coil with the connecting wire on the back all the way into the microcatheter these coils are 0.014 microcatheter compatible this is the long delivery segment and then the coil is pushed into the delivery microcatheter once there is made enough progress in pushing the coil into the microcatheter then this uh, delivery catheter is removed and now we have essentially a wire that has the coil attached at its tip the wire is pushed until the coil exits from the tip of the microcatheter and then once that happens we know exactly where the coil is and here is uh, a magnified view the coil as you can see is very very flexible so it assumes um, uh, the configuration of the vessel and then once the coil is into the vessel and we're satisfied with the location of the coil we bring in the device for delivery of the coil and release the device is pulled back and now the coil is separated from the delivery wire so now we have the coil into the vessel in the position that we like in this particular case it was early in our experience we did not have the 0.014 coils so we used a prograde microcatheter and we use a technique called block and deliver which now we favor for any kind of perforation because with new generation microcatheters and even covered stents one can have a balloon inflated 
proximal to the delivery catheter and then being able to deliver coils while having hemostasis by having the balloon inflated. And we like to call this technique block because we're blocking the undergrade flow and deliver because we're using the microcatheter to deliver coils distally. This is um, releasing one coil and this is one mistake that is important to recognize and not do in future cases. We actually used the back end of a guide wire to deliver the coil and if you can see the back end of the guide wire is actually exiting way out into the pericardium. So the lesson is don't use the back end of the guide wire if you want to use a pushable coil. This is not a detachable but the coil you push out. It's best to use a dedicated delivery catheter or use the front end of a guide wire and then one can actually see when the guide wire location is and not push it too far out. So don't push out coils with the back end of the wire, use the dedicated device or use the front end of a guide wire. The coil was deployed, it did not achieve hemostasis quite yet, that is why a second coil was deployed. And these were pushable coils, so have less control, that's why you see that the second coil was a little more proximal to the first one. And this is the detachable equivalent that can be used to deliver coils. Finally, a third detachable coil was um, deployed and now there's still some extravasation, but it appears to be slowing. And another factor to keep in mind with coils is that they don't necessarily achieve instantaneous hemostasis. For example, this coil, the Azure coil, has a polymer coating that swells over time. So in about 10 to 15 minutes, the polymer swells and hemostasis can be achieved, even though it may appear initially that there is no hemostasis achieved. That is why here there was still some bleeding. But then after waiting for a few minutes, the bleeding stopped. Because we inflated the balloon very quickly in this case, we actually did not have tamponade development and although we did have a small pericardial effusion, it was relatively small, not causing hemodynamic instability. And that highlights the importance of early inflation of a balloon to stop the bleeding into the pericardium. Similar to the previous case, how do we make sure we don't have any continuous extravasation? By giving echo contrast, we confirm there is no recurrent bleeding into the pericardium and that gives us extra reassurance that we achieved hemostasis. This is the publication that describes this case and the block and deliver technique published in CCI about two years ago. And going on to the third case, this is a little different. This was a patient who had multiple stents in his right coronary artery presenting with an instant restenotic lesion. We did IBOS and there was severe stent under expansion. So we tried to expand it using multiple high pressure balloon inflations. There's an algorithm for balloon and dilatable CTOs that is in the book, in the CTO book, and also we'll have a video for this shortly that demonstrates various different steps. And in this particular case, um, we did uh, several balloons, we used an angioscalp, there was some improvement. However, when we were contemplating actually using laser, we noticed this. And that is why it's important to look distally to see this potential stains suggesting that there is a small vessel perforation. If we go back to where the guide wire was, it is hard to know 100%, but it may be that this guide wire, which was a regular workhorse guide wire, potentially went too far out. And during all these multiple balloons and uh, inflations, the wire went further down and caused the um, injury of the distal vessel and distal vessel perforation. So going down the universal algorithm, once again, the very first step is to inflate a balloon to occlude the vessel. And um, this is what we did. The patient's blood pressure was good. And um, a 3 or 20 millimeter balloon was advanced there. But there was continued extravasation. So the next step is to treat the cause. And we decided to treat this um, initially with embolization. Now, the problem was that the perforated vessel was exceedingly small. This is a very, very small, probably less than half a millimeter in diameter vessel. And we tried to advance a transient microcatheter into that vessel and it was impossible to do so because it was so small. 
but we have again the block and delivery technique we do have the balloon here there is no bleeding here and we can inject with the microcatheter and see exactly that there's continued extravasation so what we did instead in this particular case where we could not get into the vessel is use an alternative approach which is to cover the origin of the perforated branch with a covered stand so we used the same single guide which was an eight french guide to have both the blocking balloon inside but also to deliver a 2.8 by 19 millimeter graft master stand in the uh, pl branch and successfully close off the origin of this small perforated branch and by doing that we had cessation of flow into that vessel and into the pericardium and this case was also published uh, in 2017 in CCI and shows, uh, this is a graphic illustration of it, showing that after perforation happens, the blocking balloon goes in and then a, um, there's a second wire that goes through, a cover stand is delivered next to the blocking balloon, the cover stand is deployed and the cover stand essentially covers the ostium of the small vessel and seals the perforation. There is one subgroup of patients that one should be extremely careful and this is the group of patients with previous coronary bypass graft surgery because perforations in those patients can cause loculated effusions there are adhesions in the pericardium and that is why the blood can accumulate in various parts of the myocardium and even compress various structures and cavities this is an example from a left atrial hematoma compressing the left atrium and essentially causing cardiogenic shock. The problem is draining this is not often feasible percutaneously because it's very posterior. And what was done in this case was emergency CT guided drainage. This is the CT image and this is a needle advanced from the back of the patient into the hematoma and decompression. So perforation in the post-cabas patient is a very dangerous complication and can be hard to treat that's why prevention is important and even more important is to treat it very early when it occurs so when there is a perforation in the bypass patients we don't want to let the bleeding continue one wants to take care of it immediately put a blocking balloon and then if it's a large vessel perf put a covered stand if it's a distal vessel perf then one use a coil or fat or whatever it takes to stop the bleeding as soon as possible so in summary, regarding distal vessel perforation, the first lesson is that you want to prevent this complication and you want to watch your guide wire at all times. Sometimes we do cone in so we can see better in part of the screen and minimize radiation, but we should not forget periodically to open up the shutters, a look at the entire picture, make sure that the guide wire did not go in a very far distal branch to cause problems. Also to prevent it, we want to change any polymer jacketed wires for workhorse wires, which may be less likely to damage the vessel if there is excessive movement. Small vessel perforation, one of the important lessons is that it can be small and not cause tamponade until several hours later. So we don't want to ignore it, but we want to take care of it immediately to avoid subsequent problems. The universal algorithm for, C for perforation management does apply here as well. The very first step is inflating a balloon, giving fluids, doing pericardiocentesis or calling the surgeons. This is something that should be second nature and automatic response to any of those perforations. And then if there's continued extravasation, either fat or coils can be used. They can be done using the block and deliver technique with a balloon preventing flow of blood into the pericardium and the microcatheter helping us deliver coils or fat particles. For fat particles, they can be very easily harvested from the patient, dipped into contrast and then delivered. For coils, it is excellent if uh, 0.014 coils are available, like the Axiom coils. If not, you should be aware that larger microcatheter, like the Prograde, may need to be used. And finally, in people with previous coronary bypass graft surgery, perforation is not safe and actually can be higher risk than perforation in patients with intact pericardium. Thank you.